this morning. Today's going to be something a little different for me. Uh, normally when I do a, a, a lesson, I try to put a history and then something that's practical application for us so that when we leave here, we can say, okay, we can apply this certain way. Today, now, we're going to throw that out the window. Uh, today's more of a history and just some thoughts, and I don't know why I went this route, but um, I want to talk about a little bit of a biblical history lesson about a certain entity that's mentioned in the Bible. Um, practices, his worship, and what the Bible has to say about it. And understand that, that part of this is going to be graphic, uh, and I apologize for that, but I don't know how to, to relay anything about him without it being a little graphic, so I apologize in, in advance. Um, but over the past couple of weeks, we've seen um, Roe versus Wade overturned. And when we saw this overturned, uh, and understand that does not outlaw abortion. Uh, well, Christians are taking a victory lap right now and going, woohoo, we want a victory. Well, not necessarily. All it does is put that decision into the state's hands. If a state wants to say you can still have abortions full term, then they can. So it's not like we want a victory lap. It's just that the, the, the highest court in the land has said that this is not something constitutional that we can stand on to give people that right. It has to be down to the state level. So even though we did win a victory, We'll call it that for Christians and for those babies. Um, it does not ensure that abortion is over with. I just want everybody to understand that. Still fight going on. And my wife is very passionate about this. I think we as Christians should be passionate about the fact that they're murdering children. Anybody who is not, I have to question whether or not you truly have the love of God living in you because this is not something that we should be allowing. And it's not something that's new. And that's kind of what this Bible study is about today. Um, when, and, and I'll just say this. A lot of times we as Christians say, well, we just, we don't do much anymore. We don't do anything. Well, I will say this. Like him, love him, hate him, I don't care. Donald Trump, if you voted for Donald Trump, you helped get Roe versus Wade over five because he was able to get three justices in there that helped make the decision. So you can hate the man all you want, but as a Christian, and, and trust me, he's not a Christian man. I mean, if you look at some of his history, he's not somebody I'd want to hang up there next to Billy Graham and say, woo, look at what we got here. But he brought about an end to a means, which is something that we wanted. As Christians, this is a freebie. Get out and vote. In November, we've got elections coming up. We need to vote people into office. You say we don't have a voice anymore and we don't stand up. Here's a way for you to have a voice because it does make a change. We need to make sure that the people in Georgia or Tennessee, wherever you live, are standing up for Christian values. So get out and vote. If you don't vote, shame on you. I'm not even going to pull that back. Shame on you. Get out and vote. Um, but watching this, I saw on the news women in the street distraught, grieving because their choice to take a life was taken away from them. And as I saw this, had a little bit of righteous anger come in, and I got to thinking about it. Christ throughout the world right now are that United States just took 10 steps backwards because Roe versus Wade was overthrown. And I thought, what kind of world are we living in? So I went and decided I'd go to my happy place and start reading. And where's my happy place? Leviticus. <laughs> I know that's not where most people go to read, but I went to Leviticus and started reading. And I know it's a little, little surprise, but um, I was amazed at how people can be so blinded. And, and Leviticus was one of those things. I like the law, okay? The law is real simple, and God, God makes life really simple for us. It, when, when you look at what's in here, because he says, do this, do this, do this, do this, and do this, and here's your end result. Mm -hmm. So all we got to do is follow those simple rules, and we get exactly what God wants for our lives, right? Now, we always 
biff that up somewhere along the line, but God makes it very simple for us in these laws. And so as I was looking through here, um, Leviticus always points us to Jesus too. So what does all this have to do about this entity abortion and all this other stuff? Well, it has everything to do about it. Uh, as I was reading about uh, in Leviticus, I started reading about Moloch. Anybody heard the name Moloch before, right? He's mentioned in the Bible more than once. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a history about Moloch today. And I think you'll see that even though the worship of Moloch was gotten rid of several years ago, I'm not 100% sure that it ever went away. The spirit of Moloch is the still very much alive. The spirit of Moloch is very much alive. And we will see that here very shortly as we start to do a study. Now, I will say this. Um, I'm using the Bible. I'm using the book of Enoch. Uh, I'm using the book of Commodian. And, and, and I know that sounds like a weird name, but there's, there's this uh, ancient uh, poet writer back from the first and second century who documented a lot of things. He's like Josephus was. He wrote down a lot of things. And so some of this even comes from some of his writings. So let's just, let's, you know, I get a kid, people will start reading their Bibles and start to go from Genesis through Revelation and they get to Leviticus and go, I'm done. And they, they kind of get lost in there because it is a little bit, it'll cause you to go adrift. Okay, I'm not going to lie. Leviticus gets a bad rap because it contains rules and regulations and instructions uh, delivered to the Israelites. But like I said, I think we can all learn from it. Um, the God of the Bible cared so much, and that's what I think I love about it. The God of the Bible cared so much about his people that he said, here's what you got to do. Follow that, life's good. Uh, of course, they didn't do it. We don't do it. But he cares enough about us to write it down. So let's, uh, Leviticus contains warnings about engaging in idol worship especially in the worship of Moloch. So we're going to talk about that today. Leviticus 18 and 21 um, kind of got me, uh, I was right here starting, and that's where I got into it. And, and again, Beverly, you didn't hear, but I'm giving everybody a disclaimer. Uh, some of this topic is disturbing. Um, if, if it bothers you, I apologize. You can cover your ears. But it's kind of graphic in detail. So uh, it's not sexual in nature. Uh, I, I saw her concern over her face and she looked at me. So, no, it's, uh, it's uh, not. Uh, no, that comes <laughs> later. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so Moloch is usually depicted as a bull headed anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic being, morphic being, deity. Uh, he had a, um, or he was usually um, this bullhead. Well, and I'm getting ahead of myself. His statue was usually made of bronze with arms outstretched and a belly that opened up to serve as a furnace, and his head was that of a bull. So if you get a picture, this is what you would picture, okay? His arms are like this, there's an opening in his belly, bullhead, man's body. And it's a furnace. And they would heat this furnace uh, till glowing hot. Um, and one of the particular practices of Moloch worship was infant sacrifice. And that's why hearing all this stuff about Roe versus Wade, it got me to thinking, has the, the spirit of Moloch, as, as Justin said, actually gone away? Because we're seeing this. So again, here we go. Um, Families allowed children to pass through the fire or be burned alive to Moloch to secure favor and prosperity. Uh, the children, and again, I, I apologize, but I just want y'all to see how gruesome this is, and it's no different than what we're doing today. The children would be placed on the searing hot hands of the idol while his devotees listened to the infant cry as it burned to death before their eyes. Uh, they would play drums and music loudly and dance around trying to drown out the screams. But they would do this all the while while worshiping this God. And that's uh, Leviticus 18.21 says, 
uh, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. And so now we're going to go into a little bit of a history of Molech. This is kind of where we get off into some really crazy stuff, and then I'll come back around again. But those cries that I've watched on the news from these women not being able to sacrifice their children. And then I, I read this that they would hear those cries of those infants and dance around and try to drown it out. And it just, it blows my mind that we are still in a place in this world where I feel like this is still going on, even though it was out long. But anyway, as many, uh, with many details in the Bible, um, the exact origin of Molech uh, is not exactly known. It's kind of unclear. The term Molech uh, is spelled several different ways. It's Moloch, Molech, Molech with an K. Um, the term Moloch is believed to have originated in the Phoenician MLK was what they actually referred to, uh, which referred to a type of sacrifice made to confirm or acquit about. Uh, Melech is the Hebrew word for king. It was common for the Israelites to combine the name of pagan gods with the vowels in the Hebrew word for shame, which is Bosheth. This is how the goddess of fertility of war, Asarte, became Ashtoreth. Uh, the combination of MLK and MELKH, which is the word I just mentioned earlier, uh, and Bosheth all reserve, are reserve, uh, become Moloch or Molech. So you've got this combination, and basically what would happen is the Hebrews uh, would interpret it as uh, the personified ruler. The word king is in there, and then shame is in there. So the personified ruler of shameful sacrifice. That's what that word means. So if you look Molech up in the Hebrew, it actually means the personified ruler of shameful sacrifice. It's also been spelled Milcom, Milcom, Malik. Uh, Asherteth was his consort, and ritual prostitution was considered important form of worship. So even in the in the uh, sanctuaries that they would build to Moloch. Not only did they have the child sacrifice so that you take your firstborn child and so that you would be prosper, uh, prosperous and that your family would grow and that your next children would be blessed, you take your first one and you'd sacrifice it to this God. And not only that, yeah, you got prostitutes inside the building too. So if that wasn't good enough, you could go over there and part of the worship to Moloch was they would have temple prostitutes on hand. Yes, sir. Come on in. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you sitting there. Come on in. Come on in. So, um, where did you see me? Don't move my junk over. So, anyway, now some of the things we're talking about Moloch today. I, I was telling them uh, just real quick, kind of recap, but. Um, one of the things with the with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, uh, one of the things I saw on the news is all these women are so upset over the fact they can no longer um, uh, kill their children, and there are cries in the streets, and there's all this stuff going on. So we're actually looking at kind of where this got started, and that's in the, the worship of Molech. He's back from Leviticus. Uh, it's actually throughout the Bible, but anyway, so. That was it. So uh, Ashtoreth, I mentioned earlier, was his consort. Ritual prostitution was a form of worship. So the Phoenicians were a loosely gathered group of people who inhabited Canaan, modern-day Lebanon, Syria, and Israel uh, between 1550 B.C. and 300 B.C. In, in addition to sexual rituals, um, and again, I apologize, some of this is graphic, but the worship included the child sacrifice, passing of fire. Um, I talked about the giant statue, the way his arms were made, and it was always the, the furnace, and they literally would put him on this red hot bronze statue or iron statue, and the infants would be placed on the hands, they would sear and roll into the fire, and that's how they were killed. And again, they did this so that um, they would be, the future family would be blessed and financial prosperity. Uh, Moloch wasn't, our worship wasn't limited to Canaan. They actually in North Africa have found monoliths, tomb, 
uh, they have found these monoliths and they've actually found statues with the MLK on, and that's not Martin Luther King, but it was actually the, their word mullet or MLK meant king, it meant uh, that's who they were worshiping. And so they found them as far as North Africa. Now, later on, and when it came from North Africa into Europe, Moloch was renamed Kronos. Does that ring a bell, Justin? Sure does. Kronos migrated to Carthage in Greece, and his mythology grew to include his becoming a Titan or the father of Zeus. So when you look at Greek, Greek mythology, it has its roots somewhere. Well, guess what? Moloch, this pagan god that they worshipped, uh, when he went to Greece, when they brought him in from North Africa up, they just simply changed his name and said he was a god and he was the father of Zeus. And that's how this whole line started. So he actually became the father of Zeus. Uh, Zeus. When Kronos, too, in his mythology, he ate babies. Didn't yes, he? he did. Yeah. yeah. That was his whole thing. They thought that you, you feed him babies, you would be blessed. It's the same thing. It's, it's mullet just transferred over even into the Greek. Uh, he became uh, the father of Zeus. Moloch is affiliated and sometimes equated to Baal, B A L, B A A L. And we see that in the scriptures too. Although the word Baal was also used to designate any god or ruler. Uh, there's a, Derek Gilbert, he's an author, provides a deeper look at the identity of Moloch in his book, The Last Clash of the Titans. Gilbert explains that Moloch was worshipped in the Amorite kingdom based in the unit. Uh, Euphrates River near the border between Syria and Iraq and under the name of Malik. He writes further, it appears that Malik was served by a group of underworld deities called Malaku. Gilbert goes on to explain that there was a connection between Moloch and another pagan uh, deity that has biblical importance. And there's some text links, it's a uh, Ugaric text that link Moloch to the pagan god Rapui. Uh, whose name is a singular form of the word Rephim. Now, follow me on this, okay? Um, those familiar with the Old Testament will recognize that this is the connection to Og of Bashan, uh, the last Rephim king. In fact, Gilbert writes, Rapui is described as the god enthroned at Ashertath, the god who rules Edric. Okay, now I know that's a lot of words, and I apologize, but let me, let me bring it down. Both of those cities were ruled over by Og. The connection to the Rephium seems strongly indicate that Moloch is somehow related to the Nephilim, or Nephilim mentioned in Genesis 6, uh, 1 through 4. Rephium, or Rephium, being a variant of Nephilim. So, Nephilim, according to the old or non canonical books, if you read the book of Enoch, if you read uh, the book of the Watchers, the Enoch is one of the books that originally, but when they canonized the Bible, uh, I don't know if you guys understand, there is more books than this that was floating around that time. Uh, there are five books, isn't it five? No, there's more than five. There's more. Uh, and uh, the Apocrypha is what it's called. Some Bibles to this day, even the Ethiopians still use the Bible that has all the Apocrypha in it. So there's a lot of books out there, but one of those particular books is called the Book of Enoch. Uh, but Nephilim, according to the Book of Enoch, were offspring of a group of fallen angels known as the Watchers and human women. Now we read part of that in the scriptures. Uh, even Jude refers back to the Book of Enoch. He references some quotes from the Book of Enoch. So has some historical value or else it wouldn't be in here. So understand that. But these Nephilim became so violent against humanity that God sent a flood and cleansed the earth of their evil and their sin, which was also influencing humanity to engage in various sins. So these spirits of these hybrid Nephilim became demons. This Enochian understanding of the origin of demons is what the church has held all these years. We believe that that's where demons come from. If you talk to Catholics, if you talk to Christians, most of the time that's where they believe that the demons came from, was this offspring. So again, Jude, brother of Je uh, Jesus, appeals to the account of Enoch in Jude 14. Uh, Justin Martyr wrote, the angels or the watchers 
transgressed this appointment and were captivated by the love of women, and they begat children who are those who are called demons. Second Commodianus also echoed this. So you've got a lot of people writing about this, and that's how we get that now. Is it valuable to us in our Christian walk? No, it's not. Uh, is it going to change how you believe? No, it shouldn't. Uh, does the Bible give us everything that we need for our life? Yeah. But what I'm simply doing is just making a reference to that. So, uh, Second Commodius wrote this, Such was the beauty of a woman, of women, that it turned the angels aside, as a result being contaminated, that they could not return to heaven, being rebels from God, they uttered words against him. Then the highest uttered his judgment against them, and from their seed Nephilim are said to have been born. When they died, men erected images of them. And again, we're going back to the creation of Moloch here. So Rappi, uh, Malik being attended by the underworld deities uh, may also indicate that pagans consider the Og's kingdom to be a portal gateway to the underworld. So that's your history. Now, let's look at some warnings and why. And that would kind of wrap this up. But in Genesis 12, Abraham followed God's call to move to Canaan, right? Although human sacrifice was not common in Abraham's native Ur, where he lived, it was well established in the new land. God later asked Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, we know that this was a test, right, by God to see if Abraham was faithful. But it also, uh, God was then trying to distinguish himself from Malik or Moloch because what, he, what did he do? He provided a sacrifice, right? Whereas Moloch required the sacrifice. This is what Abraham was now seeing in this land that he went to. Their God, Malik, Moloch, whatever you want to call him, was requiring them to sacrifice children. And so God twists that and says, Abraham, I need you to sacrifice your child. Well, Abraham, being full of faith to God, said, I'll do whatever you say, God, knowing that God would provide. Well, God did provide a way out of ram. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, sometimes we miss these things. But he was actually trying to prove a point to the Israelites, to Abraham and to those people that you don't have to follow the tradition of the land. You don't have to follow what the world is telling you to do. I'll provide a way and I'm better than what the world has to offer. And he provided a way so that Isaac didn't have to be sacrificed. Just like the rest of the land had done, they're all sacrificing their firstborn. God says, no, I've got a better plan if you'll just follow me. And so God proves himself to this. Uh, over 500 years after Abraham, Joshua led the Israelites out of the desert to inherit the promised land. God knew that the Israelites were immature in their faith and easily distracted from worshiping the one true God. We read about that in Exodus 32. Before the Israelites had even entered Canaan, God warned them not to participate in Moloch worship. In Leviticus 18.21, we just read that. And repeatedly told them to destroy those cultures that worship Moloch. They didn't heed it, all right? We, we know throughout history, instead they incorporated Moloch worship into their own traditions. Even Solomon, think about Solomon. What was he referred to? Anybody? What was King Solomon considered? Wisdom. Wisest man yeah. ever to live, wisest king. Guess what? He set up Moloch worship in his kingdom. This is the wisest man. It's what the Bible says. Wisest man ever to live. Yet God told him, first off, not to marry outside of the Israelites. And what did he do? He took a bunch of wives and concubines from different religions. And sorry, but guys, we all know it's true. Sometimes to keep the peace at home, we'll do things we probably shouldn't do. That's exactly what he did. He had some pagan wives. They believed him. He's down here laughing. You see that? <laughs> But <laughs> but to make some of his wives happy, he erected statues to Moloch and let them perform Moloch worship simply because he had done exactly what God told him not to do and was marry outside of marriage. And to keep the peace, that's exactly what he did. Um, so even though he was the wisest king, he really messed up too. Uh, Moloch worship occurred in the high places. 
talking about 1 Kings 2, uh, 12, 31 says this, as well as the narrow ravine outside Jerusalem called the Valley of Enon. And we all know this place. Despite occasional efforts by godly kings, the worship of Molech wasn't abolished until the Israelites. Now here's what's funny. So you had this scattered in with all the Israelites uh, still trying to do this practice of sacrificing children or temple prostitution, whatever they could to get better themselves, to, to prosper their family. And so you had all this going on. So what does God do to get it abolished out of the land of Israel? Babylonian captivity. You got a pagan nation comes in and takes over Israel, right? And we read about where the Babylonians come in. And although the Babylonian religion was uh, pantheistic and characterized by astrology and, uh, astrology and divination, it did not include human sacrifice. So it even took a pagan country coming in and basically taking over Israel. God said, you know what? I'll fix this. If you won't get rid of it, I'll get rid of it one way. And he put them under pagan rule for a long time. But he chose a pagan nation to rule them over that didn't believe in human sacrifice anymore. So that was how he weeded it out of Israel. Sometimes, and I've been there. I've been on the receiving end of that being taken to the woodshed. It's not a lot of fun. But sometimes God has to take us to the woodshed and put us through things in order for us to finally see that what he's trying to do is better for us and, and his ways are right. Well, that's exactly what he did with here. When the Jews returned to their land, uh, they rededicated themselves to God and the Valley of Hinnon was turned into a place of burning garbage and the bodies of executed criminals. Jesus uses the imagery of this place, an eternal burning fire consuming countless human victims to describe hell. Now again, this was where Moloch worship was originally set up in the Valley of Hinnon. So they had a temple there to worship this God that asked you to sacrifice your children, temple prostitution, but then God takes them out. When they finally get to go back, they said, we hate this so much, we're gonna turn this into a big pile of garbage dump. And that's what they did. And uh, again, God describes that place in Matthew as hell. That's what he's using to refer to as hell. So let's see what it talks about today. Uh, with these facts in mind, it's even more important that we perhaps first thought when you think about it to avoid adultery. Uh, while it's true that the physical idol is nothing to fear, First Corinthians tells us we don't have to, if I had a, a, an idol of Buddha right here on my desk or whatever, Shiva, right, with all the arms and stuff, uh, sitting here. Oh, you'd have a Cthulhu. Oh, okay. See, see. But anyway, we wouldn't have to be afraid of that image itself, would we? If I had a Moloch statue here, I wouldn't have to actually walk up and be physically afraid of it. But what the Bible is teaching us is the diabolical presence behind those things is what we need to fear. And, and I'll go into that a little bit more. I had a um, an individual uh, come to me here a couple of years ago. And they were seeing things in their home. They, they'd gone through a traumatic experience and they were starting to see things. Uh, they were starting to hear voices. And all of her friends were trying to help her. And they were bringing in dream catchers. They were bringing in statues. They were bringing in, I'm like, go home and throw all of that in the garbage. It's not that those little things themselves mean anything. But if you put value in what's behind them, that's what you have to be afraid of. And we as Christians need to fear what's behind those things, not the images of themselves. So God warned the Israelites not to make idols nor to offer them uh, in worship. Again, Leviticus, Leviticus uh, 16, or 26, Leviticus 19. These warnings did not cease with the coming of Christ, but remain a commandment to us to this day. The Apostle John commands us in his first epistle to guard ourselves against idols. That's 1 John 5, 21. This is militant language. All right, understand this. When first, or John wrote this, he didn't write a casual letter saying, hey, you need to stay away from us. He's using military terms. So a militant uh, uh, command here. And what it's saying is guard oneself. It, it's like taking a... Combat, uh, combat defensive position. 
If I told you, okay, you need to watch out. Somebody's going to come around that corner in a minute and scare you. You'd be like, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. If I told you somebody was coming around that corner in a minute to shoot you or to take your life or to try to hurt you, you'd take a different stance, wouldn't you? You'd flip the desk up, you'd get in a position where you're ready to take on whatever's coming to you. That's what John tells us to do with idols today. Now, we can make an idol of anything. We're talking about something different here. But what I'm talking about is true idol worship. And it goes on in the Christian church. People worship uh, deities, I mean uh, uh, angels. We talked about in one of our Bible studies, why do we not have the original canon of the, the scriptures, the original writings that Paul wrote? Could you imagine if we had a letter that was handwritten by Paul today? What would happen? People would start worshiping that letter and Paul that wrote it instead of what it says. So what we have is we have copies of the original letters, but we haven't found any single original writing, and that's a good thing. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are copies of those things. Uh, we talk about angels. There's, and I went online, and I don't recommend this. There's groups of people who worship Michael the archangel. Uh, you've got to be real careful where you go with this stuff, so just be careful. But it's a militant language, uh, a language that you use. If indeed an idol holds no danger to us, then why would the Bible warn us about idol worship? So, we need to guard against it. The apostles speak in such terms because he recognizes the spiritual reality behind idol. Paul recommends his readers to literally retreat again, military term, from idolatry in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. He isn't suggesting we run in fear, but as members of the church militia, we all are in a battle every single day. We're part of God's army fighting against an enemy that's trying to take the very souls of mankind. And I wish we would take that more seriously. But this is a war. It's a war for, if you're saved, it's not your soul anymore. But it's the souls of those people around us, our families, our friends, those that we come in contact with every day. It's a war for their souls. Because right now, if they do not know Jesus, they're lost. And they're on the wrong side of this. So, but God says those entities that behind, or behind, or Paul says, behind those entities, we need to run, but not run in fear, but run as a strategic retreat from something that is dangerous to our combat readiness or our spiritual health. In other words, he's saying, unless you're just super Christian, these these demons that are behind these things, you need to steer clear of because we're not capable of him. We have to turn that over to God and simply steer clear of them. How many homes do you go into? And we've been on some visitations and stuff, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm a salesman by nature. So when you walk into somebody's office, the first thing you do is you're looking around to see what they're into. You know, have got pictures of grandkids or baseball or whatever it is, where did they go to college, and you're trying to make some kind of connection with this person you never met before, so hopefully you can relate to them and sell them something at some point in time. But we, we've been in homes and visitation, and I, I'll go in and I'll look around, and I'm thinking, oh my God, they literally have a Buddha over here on the, on the shelf. They're claiming to be Christian, but they got a baby Buddha over here. Or they've got this over here, or they've got a crucifix, you know, which I understand, but I mean, I'm just saying, you start to look at all these things and you think, what kind of struggles are they going through in their life? Simply because they've allowed Satan to enter in the home, and even in something as simple as that. We have to be very cautious of what I'm getting at. Um, Paul tells us that those who engage in idolatry cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And that's 1 Corinthians 6 5. So, why does Paul warn about uh, adultery? Just like uh, John and every other apostle, prophet, or saint, Paul understood spiritual realities behind idols. These that are demons working toward the destruction of man, removing from the worship of the one true God. That's the whole point. If you can put these in there, why would you even look at that statue of Buddha or Sheba or whoever when you've got God? Anything that distracts us from God the enemies won. 
may be for a minute, it may be for a day, it may be for who knows how long, but when you put your interest in that instead of in the one true God, the living Savior, then he's won just a small victory. And over a period of time, he can win big victories, uh, or he can. So, I don't know a single person who hears about, I mean, if I told you that there was a, a, a church in Fort Oglethorpe that worshiped Moab, and that they were having child sacrifices, Temple prostitution, that not one person in this room would be appalled at that. Appalled at the fact that they're killing innocent children. And why are they doing it? For future benefits. We would say that that is the evilest thing in the world. Yet, we're not a whole lot better than the ancient Canaanites right now. Instead of sacrificing our children to the god Moloch in exchange for future prosperity, we sacrifice our children in exchange for better career paths, financial security, or convenience. And they're calling this, and, and I'm, not, I'm not against anybody who's had an abortion. It, anybody can do it, and, and, and God can forgive them for it. That's not the problem. But when we as a nation see that, we need to, we need to stand up and we need to say something. And that's what the Bible's teaching us. While abortion apologists try to sanitize abortion terms right now, like using words tissue uh, instead of baby, end of pregnancy instead of killing, there's no denying what's going on when we inject poison into these children. We're brutally murdering them. And we've done it millions of times. Yet at the same time, a large number of people today believe this ancient practice would be fine so as long as the baby is still in the womb. And so as I was studying all this and as I was reading, uh, New York legislators, I don't know if y'all read, they've passed a law now after Roe versus Wade that still allows, and again, I said earlier, Roe versus Wade does not outlaw abortion. It simply gives it to the states. When New York has passed a law that says you can still have an abortion up to birth. So right up to nine months, they're saying it's okay. Um, after the vote, a video circulated on the internet of hundreds of people dancing and shouting in the streets like this. And as I was watching this video, these women dancing and shouting and praising the fact that they could murder their children, I got to thinking back to that sacrifice at Moloch where they would play the drums to drown out the screams and cries of those kids back then. And watching these people dance and scream at the murder of these children. I don't know that we've progressed. I don't know, as, as Justin said, I think the spirit of Moloch is still alive and well. I think um, we need to continue the fight. We need to continue, get out and vote. Um, but when we are still doing this today in modern society, uh, I think there's a problem. And so I, I just wanted to I, like I said, I got off on a weird tangent this week studying this, but I don't think it's gone away. And we as Christians need to still stand up and fight. Um, what can you do? You can vote. Um, you can get involved. There are places around town. Uh, the one thing, and I want to say this, one of the complaints is, is what do you do after you have the children? Well, there's a need for foster care. There's a need for... Um, uh, this government that we live in to give incentives to people to have children, to help them afterwards. We can't just stand up and say you can't kill them and then walk away and do nothing. We as Christians also have to provide help afterwards too. So make sure that you're involved in any way you can. That's my one little pitch in here for, for something that we've become very passionate about over the last few years. Uh, we're involved with choices. Anybody who's not, please get involved. Uh, but Pray about it. Uh, like I said, I was kind of amazed that we're not as far progressed as as I really hoped that we were, and we're still doing the same thing. So uh, let's pray and be dismissed. Um, Father, we just love you so much. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your love and your mercy, Lord. Lord, I, I thank you for the word that you've given us that we can go in and we can read and we can study, Lord. You've, You've given us direction for our life, Lord. You're not trying to keep us from having a good life or having a good time. Lord, you're simply giving us instructions to help us to live the best life possible. 
And so, Lord, I'm so thankful that you gave us your word. I'm thankful that you gave these men the vision that they needed to write these words down. And the Holy Spirit inspired each and every one of these. And Lord, I pray that we can take these words, Lord. We can apply them to our heart. Sometimes we think they're so small it doesn't matter. But Lord, you gave us instructions in your words for a reason. And I pray that we can apply this to our hearts. And I pray today, Lord, as we go into the service, Lord, you bless the songs that are sung, Lord. Help us to, to get our hearts right for the for the uh, move of the Spirit today, Lord. And then as, as Brother Tim gets up there and preaches, Lord, I pray that you just hide him behind the cross, Lord. That all that we can see is you and your word being spoken to each and every one of us, Lord. I pray that we have an open mind and an open heart today and we're receptive to the Holy Spirit of God, Lord. And just let him move freely throughout the spirit, our uh, service today, Lord. And I pray that anybody that does not know you today as their, as their uh, personal Savior, Lord, I pray that you would make them miserable, Lord. That the only way that they can get any relief is to just sprint down to that altar and come to know you as their personal Savior. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask all these things the only way we can. And that is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.